Okay, recording on location from our individual houses during a shelter in place order. I'm Public Affairs Director Matthew Huffman, and this is Momentum, a webcast produced by your coalition connecting advocates across our state. So today I am joined by members of our prevention capacity building cohort. Uh, so two fellow MCA DSV staffers, Nicole and Nora, and then Phoenix from Safe Connections and Rachel from Harmony House. Welcome all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this is a little different from how we normally record the webcast uh, because we are all remote. But that also gives us the opportunity to match faces with names. And so this time, all of our listeners will be able to see who we are, along with hearing our voices. So uh, thank you for being on the webcast this month. Um, and uh, this is a conversation that kind of got started last month, whenever Nicole wrote an article for our latest newsletter about how we're all preventionists right now. Um, so regardless of our job title, our primary job responsibilities, that really both in our professional and our personal lives, um, that we have a role to play in keeping our community safe and working to slow the spread of the virus. Um, so really working alongside our coworkers in a different way, working alongside community partners in a different way, and all really kind of adjusting in the moment. Uh, but we all have a role to play in prevention right now. And so we brought it up in our uh, in our cohort call earlier this month too, and there was some interest in continuing that conversation and digging a little deeper into it in our webcast this month. Um, so again, I'm excited that all of you are on here today for us to have a deeper conversation about things. Um, so to get us started, I really just wanted to jump into conversation with uh, Phoenix and Rachel. So for the two of you, um, what prevention efforts are happening at your programs right now and how has the response to the pandemic affected your work? Phoenix, go ahead. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so as you know, all schools in Missouri are closed until next year. So everything that we had planned for the schools is gone. Um, I also have been in contact with a lot of our summer camp partners and they don't know yet if they are going to be hosting summer camps. So as of right now, we're scheduling stuff for the fall. Mm -hmm. We have decided to continue with some of our prevention efforts through a lot of our online learning. Our groups, which happen in schools, are actually going to be taken online. They are support groups for their single gender groups um, for students to talk about masculinity, what it means to be a man. Um, they, they talk about topics such as power, control, healthy relationships, communication skills, sexual assault, consent, um, really wide range of topics uh, with the aim of changing the culture of the school. They are going to be taken online. We are very excited about that. We also are going to be doing a prevention takeover one day a week of the Safe Connections um, Facebook page. We're gonna be posting articles and fun things aimed specifically at parents of teens to help them talk to their teens, understand what their teens are going through during this time. And our big thing that we've been working on is our new Instagram page. Um, cool. Super excited. It is launching this Friday. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of fun quizzes. We have Instagram, or not Instagram bingo, we have pandemic bingo, um, virus <laughs> pickup lines, stuff like that. Our goal is to create a fun place for teens to come and talk about these types of things. We each have a list of resources, both places they can call and places they can text if they're needing support. And we'll be offering open communication through our direct messaging as well. Our goal is to keep students occupied. Um, we've done quite a bit of research and students are not doing as much schoolwork. <laughs> I know that they're still on Imagine, that. yeah. So this is really a good chance for us to reach out to them and keep the conversation going. Wow. That's so very cool. cool. Yeah, that's so yes. cool. 
I really mm-hmm. like that you all have been able to adapt your efforts to meeting uh, youth where they are, and that's online right now. And I think it's such a really smart thing to be engaging parents online as well and how they can support youth and reinforce uh, the prevention messages that you all are doing. That's really cool. Yes, it's super important to keep them engaged because we know that they're still having relationships. They may not be physically in the same space. And unfortunately, you know, abuse, power control, manipulation, these things still happen when they aren't in the same physical space. Um, So yeah, that's kind of our goal to keep them occupied, keep them interested. Yeah. Well, it sounds like y'all are doing a great job. Thanks for sharing all of that. Uh, Rachel, how are things in Springfield? Yeah, um, so prevention efforts are definitely looking different for me here. Um, Like Phoenix, I had a really busy spring planned. Um, We finally got connected with our local um, private Catholic high school and we were doing, um, we were about halfway through our prevention efforts with them um, when COVID hit. So um, and then we had a partnership with a local after school program that was new um, that we we're going to roll out um, safe dates with for the first time. But um, unfortunately, all of that has been postponed um, to hopefully the fall. And then um, with COVID hitting, um, it just kind of made sense to transition me into our emergency shelter. Um, our advocacy staff were really needing some support um, with new additional responsibilities. So. Um, prevention is kind of halted, unfortunately, for me here in Springfield um, because I've been taking on um, those other responsibilities in our emergency shelter um, full time. And so I've definitely still been in contact with our, um, our partners in prevention um, in the community, letting them know that we're still here for them. Um, I have had um, a couple contacts in our community um, reaching out about, hey, do you have any online resources for the students that we're working with? So I'm thankful that I've still been able to connect with some of our community partners in that way. Um, And then today I do have a phone call with my partner in prevention here in Springfield, Christina Ford. um, And we're going to be talking about how to take some of this, um, some of this learning online, um, talking about maybe doing some video projects together. Um, I think Um, Thankfully, we're a bit more staffed in our emergency shelter, so within the next couple weeks, I think I'll be able to start transitioning back to doing my um, prevention work full time. Um, But until then, I just am trying to stay connected with our partners in the community, letting them know that we're here for them. Um, I'm also doing a little bit of research on Google Classroom to try to figure out how to um, transition some of our learning um, and our prevention work to that, just to provide that option for folks. Um, But like Phoenix, just trying to kind of look ahead for the fall. I would love to schedule some things for the summer, but um, with everything so up in the air, we just don't know. So we've kind of got our eye on the fall for in-person prevention and um, hopefully going to start making some more connections with virtual prevention in the next couple weeks. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that, um, I think that something folks have all been kind of adjusting to in the pandemic response is uh, making sure that we continue to really reach out to those community partners and not letting those relationships take a back burner. So even if our day-to-day responsibilities have changed a bit, just being able to maintain those relationships for the work, I think are really important. Um, And folks are figuring out really quickly how to adapt their community efforts and still keep those partnerships available. So I appreciate you kind of sharing how you've worked through that, Rachel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Something that I'm not doing so much, but our agency is doing that I'm kind of excited about. And I think think we can spend most things and like to look like their prevention in some way. Um, But um, our agency has recently reached out to all the pharmacies in our our community, um, because as we know, this has really changed things for victims. Um, COVID response has really changed things and shelter in place has really changed things for victims and and put a lot more barriers to victims um, getting assistance. And so we've reached out to all of our um, pharmacies in the area and surrounding communities and gave them kind of like a code word, um, the pharmacist a code word to use. Um, So if victims use this code word, um, which is mask 19, um, to the pharmacist, they know that they need assistance and they'll call us or, um, or emergency response right away. Um, so we're really thankful that um, even though it's not directly um, 
prevention. I think that we're um, doing a lot of safety planning um, in that way with folks in our community. So I'm thankful for that. What a great idea. I'm super thankful for it. Yeah. And I hope that it um, helps connect folks to resources that otherwise, you know, don't have that access at home right now. Yeah, I love that thinking. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nicole. Well, I was just going to say because of um, the new community connections that you're building. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you always had awesome relationships with the pharmacists in town, but that's not a connection I've thought of before. <laughs> no, and I hadn't really either. So that's something that I had thought of as well that, um, you know, after things calm down a bit, maybe that's some education that we can provide um, those pharmacies in the community um, with, you know, things to look out for, red flags, resources in our community, um, now that we're building those relationships that we hadn't really had before. So I'm definitely excited for that possibility, especially during this time. Yeah, because who knows what could happen. I think a lot of the prevention the like exciting ideas that we come up with seem to be in response to sort of a new urgent issue. Like we know that violence is an urgent issue and we're trying to prevent it all the time. But when something like this comes up, um, we start scrambling. And like you said, you had to jump into a different position and you're still working on community connections and everything you do is gonna go forward once we finally get through this, cause we will. <laughs> And there might be new exciting things, like who knows what a collaboration with your local pharmacies could, could do. Absolutely. Um, so I'm excited to hear about after this, once we get through it, of course, no rush. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, Rachel, going back to something that you mentioned with uh, just with staffing uh, there at Harmony House and moving you back over to work uh, in some of the direct services and in shelter, I think that that's, um, that's also something that many member agencies across the state quickly had to adjust to. Um, so Nicole and Nora, I know that y'all have been on a lot of the regional calls and uh, a lot of the affinity group conversations that have been happening over the last month. Um, so what else did you hear from advocates across the state? What else are folks dealing with in their communities? Well, um, I think prevention is, uh, advocates and programs in general are doing very creative and innovative things in order to continue to do their work during these unprecedented and very strange times. Um, as far as prevention, we have heard some really cool ideas of things that people are doing to remain connected with their partners, to remain connected with students um, in schools. Uh, the other day we were on a call with Rosebrooks and they um, are actually recording videos of prevention lessons and sending them to teachers to share um, with their students, which is, they said is a great um, break for the teachers and they're still getting those ah, prevention cool. lessons to the, to the students who need them. So I thought that was really cool. And then they're also gonna be launching um, website that they can post the videos to so students can go ahead and access the videos whenever it's convenient for them which I thought was a really great idea too. Yeah that and, is really cool. Yeah on the same call is interesting. Um, Matza brought up some issues related to technology and moving a lot of these kinds of um, prevention efforts online but it can be hard to reach students who maybe don't have access to the internet or access to, you know, mm -hmm. technology in order to connect with, and then just kind of measuring who they're reaching is, is a new challenge because as things are online, you don't always know who's participating or who you're able to reach or not. And so um, it can be hard to kind of capture who, who's actually participating in your prevention programming. Mm -hmm. But, you know, People doing this work are incredibly creative and I know very solutions focused and successful at coming up with great solutions to these issues. So just kind of as our work changes, um, new issues will arise and we'll figure out solutions to them. So, Yeah, I think one of the things that I've heard the most is for preventionists is having to cancel everything. Yeah. And it's such a heavy feeling because we know that um, people doing prevention advocacy are like fighting for every opportunity to go talk about these issues 
and like make an impact. Um, and so it kind of, I, can, I notice it looks like the rug has been pulled out from under everybody. Um, and at the same time, we are all great at technology. Now we're fantastic at video conferencing. <laughs> we're pulling out all the stops with social media, like Phoenix was saying. And so um, that's where most people are going is, all right, how do we get even a snippet of what we were going to talk about into social media? Um, and like Rachel was saying, just keeping up those connections. So whoever we're having to, well, we don't have to cancel. Whoever coronavirus is canceling things on, <laughs> reaching out to them and making sure that um, we're here for you for whatever you need. And I think the, one of the hard things too is hearing back that like, we don't need anything, we need to cancel. Um, we can't think of what, what to do. And so now is a really good opportunity for planning, which is what some programs are doing. Um, it's just like, you know, what do we have? Can we adjust any of our curriculum to, to make sure that our messaging is what we want for the future or to match the current situation? And then how do we get it out to people? So I'm really excited about this technology <laughs> thing. And, um, I know Nora was saying people don't have access and, and I think it's gonna highlight now that everybody is having to use technology at this level and yeah. people were using because they needed access, right? Um, now that we all have to deal with the challenges, we might get better at it. We might start putting some energy into making it more streamlined and, and really have a good tool for the future. So I'm excited to expand our reach in that way. I think everybody's doing a great job adapting. <laughs> Yeah, at the last prevention cohort meeting, uh, there was this big kind of emphasis on planning for the future and taking a break and taking a step back and saying, how could we do this differently? Or how could we do this in a way that's meeting students' needs better? And so it'll be really cool to see what grows out of that and what comes out of that. And I think even though these are really challenging times, there's also some interesting new positive developments that are happening that I think we should all embrace and celebrate, um, even though we're struggling with some of the challenges that we're facing too. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point is that, that you know, initially, this was a really difficult thing for everyone to wrap our minds around and think about how we're going to quickly adjust our services and how we adjust working alongside community partners and continuing our prevention efforts. Um, but it's also a really nice silver lining of it allows us to now take this time to do more planning and uh, be really introspective and evaluate what's working well in our prevention efforts. What can we adapt to reach more people? Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that that's an exciting time for us. Um, and kind of adding on to that, I think it's also forced us to be creative in how we adapt our prevention messages to different populations. Um, so yeah, Rachel, like you were saying, with reaching out to pharmacies, that's a new community partnership with a very different message than maybe we've ever thought of before. So I'm kind of curious, uh, Rachel and Phoenix, for y'all, in your messaging to the community with your other partners, has that had to change or adapt in any way in response to the pandemic. Um, and really specifically, I'm kind of thinking about a question that, that I got a lot from reporters, which was really trying to ask, you know, well, does domestic violence and sexual violence actually go up right now? Are people going to be getting more calls? And what can people do in response to that if they want to help? So we had to work really hard in kind of laying a foundation to help folks understand that natural disasters don't cause domestic or sexual violence, but we do know that in the event of a natural disaster, including pandemics, that the frequency and severity of intimate partner violence can go up and really talk about some of these underlying issues. Um, but we also really made a point to say, you know, when it comes to prevention, we are already really good at practicing bystander intervention as a safety strategy. 
And even though we might not be able to directly or indirectly intervene in person, we can still be practicing that strategy now by continuing to reach out to folks, by doing those check-ins, by making sure that we are supporting people. Um, and even though we might be having to do that at a distance, we can still be practicing these safety strategies. Um, so I'm kind of curious just to hear from y'all. Have you had to adapt the way that you talk about things with folks? Um, we definitely have. One of the things, you know, especially with our Instagram page, we are, yes, we are focused on relationships, but we're also specifically talking a lot about self-care, bystander yeah. attention, um, how to handle things if you're getting upset, how to communicate and work through conflicts, um, mm -hmm. because we're seeing that become a huge thing. Um, something else I also forgot to mention, we had some postcards printed up that have some self-care tips as well as some resources if students are feeling unsafe in the home and we're actually going to be sending those out as well that we have had in groups. Our goal is to let them know that there is support available um, because a lot of them are maybe seeing unsafe situations at home or they've seen situations which were unsafe that have now become significantly worse. So we are talking a lot about how to take care of yourself when you're kind of stuck in that situation and what to do if you need to intervene. So it's, yeah. it's a different message. It's obviously still all about relationships, but we're kind of getting to more of the how do we handle when relationships are going bad. Well, I think that that's such a really good point too with those postcards that you're sending out. So the other day I heard a, a story on NPR about how for many students, school is considered their safe place where they know they have a trusted adult, where they know they're gonna get a solid meal, where they know that they're gonna have that connection to their peers um, and how difficult that is for youth right now who are at home and don't have that peer connection and might not have access to that trusted adult. Uh, so I think that that's a really great idea to just show young people, we are still here, we still have this connection. It's, I've been lucky enough to be in touch with a couple of school social workers. And thankfully they said they've been able to kind of keep in close contact. Um, one thing that's helping in the St. Louis area, there's a lot of food distribution programs for students. And so whenever they're out distributing food, they're kind of able to check in with students a little bit to make sure that they're doing okay, kind of be that trusted adult if they don't necessarily have one in the home. Yeah, that's fantastic. It is. I also, I will say, I kind of feel like neighborhoods are watching out a little bit more. Um, I know specifically within my neighborhood, it's a one-way street, so, and everyone is always out on the street, so people are watching out for the kids. Um, it seems like people are kind of, I don't want to say in each other's business, but they are more aware of what's going on around them, which I yeah. think is a really good protective factor. Yeah, I agree. It's certainly built up more um, close-knit connections in communities. Yes. Yeah. How about for you, Rachel? Yeah, um, I think our um, overwhelming messaging as an agency has just been one of support, like letting folks know that we're still here, um, we're still available. I think especially on social media, we've been focusing a lot on safety planning and risk reduction um, with folks and letting them know that that's an option that we're here to help them with as well. Um, something I've, I've been really um, inspired by is just our community stepping up and um, because we have heard so many reports about, you know, DV increasing or the different barriers that victims are facing. Um, and to see our community really step up and take notice of that and to have these conversations, even though they are online, um, I'm seeing a lot more of that, which is um, super um, hopeful for me. Um, something that I've seen a lot, um, not so much on the Harmony House page, but um, on various other social medias that's really um, warmed my heart, and I'm sure you guys have seen this as well, is um, 
folks posting like, hey, um, if, you, um, if you message me and tell me that you need makeup, I'll know that you need, um, need some support or need me to contact resources for you. And I've seen so many just friends and family posting that and just having that awareness um, that maybe we wouldn't have had before this. Um, and so I'm really thankful for that, that our community is kind of coming together um, with those types of things. But yeah, overwhelmingly, our message has just been of support. Um, and thankfully, um, like I said, as things kind of start to transition back for me, um, we're going to do some more um, support for our youth. Um, but unfortunately, I just haven't been able to um, have a lot of um, time or attention to focus on that right now, just with everything changing. Um, but yeah, I've just been really heartened to see our community come together and support survivors during this time. Yeah, that's amazing. I know it, it kind of seems like a small thing that people are finally posting on Facebook. Like we've been posting on Facebook for years, <laughs> but now it's in the news and, and it's nice to see that people are having um, some kind of emotional connection to say, you know, maybe I didn't notice this issue was so pressing before, but now that it is, I want to do something and that they're trying whatever they know how to do. That's a, that's a nice sign, even in the worst of times, you know, that, that people care about this issue, care about survivors and the work we're doing. Um, wow, something to keep us going <laughs> as it looks. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's such a great point, Nicole. I appreciate you saying that because um, I also saw a lot of those posts going around on my social media, and I do think it's a really encouraging thing that people want to help. Uh, and maybe people who uh, weren't formally connected to a domestic or sexual violence program previously, um, or who were involved in you know formal prevention efforts, they see a need for it, and they're taking it on and trying to help folks in their own social networks uh, and in their own social support systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm um, definitely, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead, Rachel. Um, yeah, and it definitely is encouraging, and I hope that we can keep up that momentum with more prevention efforts, and folks yeah. are maybe a little bit more um, in tune to the needs of survivors, and if we can kind of transition that momentum to, hey, prevention is really important um, now that we have everybody's attention, because um, like you said, it's so important for folks to connect to their own social networks um, and spread these messages and spread that support. So I'm really um, encouraged that once things calm down a little bit, that we'll keep up that uh, momentum with prevention efforts. I was thinking yeah. as y'all were talking about kind of new messages that you're putting out, um, how I think um, within advocacy programs, this kind of connection to public health and um, ending domestic and sexual violence has become more and more clear throughout this uh, crisis. Like the foundations of many um, prevention efforts are rooted in public health, primary preven prevention, you know, um, preventing violence before it happens. And so many efforts that advocacy programs have had to do because of this public health crisis are also preventing you know, COVID before it happens in, in programs or in survivors or in communities. And so these kinds of public health approaches, I think are um, just something that everybody is maybe understanding and, and using in their day-to-day -day uh -huh. life more. And um, yeah, like maybe harnessing some of that for future prevention efforts, um, it, it would be a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Nora, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I was going to say, as uh, I don't know if everyone watching and listening knows, but Matthew and Nora are public health. Um, I don't know. Nerds. You can nerds. say it. Okay, nerds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're a little nerdy about public health. And I'm a fan too, but I um, didn't study it. And what I love about the public health approach is that it's just so obvious. It's so straightforward. It's so easy to understand. You see a need, an issue, and um, the public health approach tells us to like figure out what's going on and then decide to do something about it and then make sure that what you're doing is effective and keep doing it. So obvious and it's exactly what advocates do all the time. And so um, I love that like we can apply it to sexual violence, domestic violence and abuse um, 
for you know the the span of our lives if we want and that right now when we see this huge urgent issue coming up like coronavirus and how it's changing everything we know like our instinct is to jump on that and go help um and i think the beauty of that simple approach is to say okay we're doing it even when it gets boring to be doing <laughs> what we're doing, even when it gets boring to be stuck in the house, even when it gets annoying to check temperatures all the time and my hands are dry <laughs> because I keep washing them. Like, but you're doing prevention. You're preventing the most urgent issue um, at this moment from expanding and making those other urgent issues that you're fighting against from getting worse. Um, and it might be hard to remember that, but I think there's only four steps. Just like see the problem, do something about the problem, keep doing it. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up, Nicole, because I also wanted to ask folks. I think we are, we're beginning to really think about post-pandemic, mm -hmm. what are our services going to look like? How are we going to be doing prevention? And is that going to look different? So how has the pandemic shaped the way we do our work? Um, and I'm curious to hear from all of you, what do you see on the horizon for our prevention efforts? <laughs> Aside from um, everyone uh, beginning to love public health as much as Nora and I do. <laughs> I'm really optimistic. We have been talking about doing more online stuff for years and we just have not had the time or capacity. And so this has really given us a chance to start some of these online projects that we've been wanting to do for a while. Our goal is to keep young people engaged, even when school is back in session, because we know that they do end up doing a lot of their learning online. Um, they do look to websites and social media for answers. And so we really want to keep that up and keep that going so that those messages are out there and being passed around. I do suspect we'll be doing stuff online for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I definitely think that this has uh, uh, shown a light on the fact that we can really enhance our online options. Uh, and I agree with you. I'm excited to see where that's going to go. Yeah, I would just kind of second what Phoenix said. Um, I this whole thing has really got me thinking about how, um, I don't want to say short-sighted, but um, how I really thought like prevention just had to be in person. You had to have that face-to-face -face connection, which is so important. Um, but as Nicole mentioned earlier, like as preventionists, we are fighting um, to get an hour in front of um, students or in front of folks in our community. And sometimes that's a big challenge for the, um, the partners that we're serving. So I'm just so excited and optimistic that we're going to have other options um, to offer folks in our community with the virtual learning and um, the, the expanded reach that that's going to have that maybe um, those, those folks or those partners wouldn't have the capacity um, to have us come in for an hour, but they can do some online learning. They can make that fit into their schedule. So I'm really excited um, that hopefully out of all this, we're going to reach more people in, in more creative and innovative ways that I know I would not have thought about before. So um, I'm definitely, like Phoenix said, really optimistic about that. Kind of thinking the same things, Rachel, like I think this public health crisis has really highlighted um, who is more vulnerable to the COVID, um, to, to coronavirus, um, and it has highlighted a lot of issues around health equity um, and disparities in health. And so maybe um, those kinds of just kind of like public outrage over the, um, the inequity that exists that would leave some people more vulnerable to uh, the coronavirus or that would leave some people more vulnerable to domestic or sexual violence um, will help us all cast a wider net and make, sh make sure that we're including those people who are vulnerable in our services and our prevention efforts. So hopefully this will become maybe a call to be more inclusive and addressing health inequities as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm interested too in um, 
everything Laura said. Yeah, like looking at our public health approach, what we're doing, not only like who we're reaching, but um, we know that some people are uh, not getting access to the services that we want them to have. Like no matter how far we put them out, like somehow there's a, there's a connection missing. And I think now is a good time where we can see those coming out more and we can say, you know, maybe we're not going to make every single connection right now in the middle of coronavirus. We're still locked down, you know, stay home. <laughs> and we can at least start identifying them and say, is there an easy way that I could connect to this group over here? Um, is there a way that we connected with them in the past that we haven't had time like that? What Phoenix said about we want to put everything online. Yeah, we've been wanting to put everything online forever. We knew that was a good idea. And there's just no time. So now that this is the most urgent thing on our plates, we can spend the time on it and make those little extra connections that'll keep us going forward. I think that's so exciting. And um, one of the other things I'm interested in seeing, and, and I'm sorry, I don't wanna take over the webcast here, but I'm wondering, since our programs are creating so much online content, if you have seen, um, any content or I'll, I'll at least now be on the lookout for um, what messages like the youth and young people are putting out about violence prevention right now or about their community connections or what they're doing. Um, because I also know like young people learn from the internet and they learn from each other. Whatever they want to say <laughs> is going to now be a wonderful fact that everybody in the class learns. And so what are they putting out there? Um, you know, how are our messages that we're putting out matching up with what our target audiences are already thinking and saying? I will say, so part of our job is to be online. So um, on TikTok, I've been watching, they have some of the most amazing stuff about healthy relationships. Uh, uh, the healthy relationship hashtag and just was inundated with <laughs> that we're all about healthy relationships. There's a lot of memes about healthy relationships. There's so much of it out there. And it's so great to see them interested in it. Um, one of the big TikTok trends that I saw, it actually started last year where when folks had gotten abusive or controlling phone messages from their partners, mm. they set that to music and danced to it. Whoa. Like, oh. okay, I'm not listening to this because I'm not, yeah up with this because I deserve a healthy relationship. Um, there's just all sorts of really great stuff that they're doing and I love it. I'm here for it. I'm yeah <laughs> I've, I've subscribed yeah. to TikTok so. Yeah exactly. Let's join the 21st century. Let's follow the kids. They know what's <laughs> up. <Yes. laughs> they're having fun and um and obviously like some of us have more years and experience and time reading books and, <laughs> and working on this issue. And so um, we can provide more information, but really matching, you know, like meet people where they're at. And if our target are students, we need to figure out where they're at or kids or the parents, which yeah, love that idea. Mm -hmm. Where are they all at right now? And right at this moment, we have such a, um, not good, but such a strong connection to other people because we are all experiencing the coronavirus. We are all experiencing some kind of upheaval in our lives because of the same issue. Um, so we can, at least maybe we can connect over that. People need things to laugh at, people need things to look at and read. And um, I think it's awesome that you all are figuring out how to put that stuff out there in a way that people are gonna be excited about. Yeah, I love how you all at Safe Connections take these very serious, difficult to discuss topics and kind of make them fun and educational and interesting. Yeah. But you add that element of humor um, that I think is really important. We try. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of laugh about it because I, you know, obviously during the school year we're pretty busy, but now I feel like all of the educators are working even more. We're just working in our pajamas and comfy clothes instead. But yeah, we've been doing so much stuff. It's like we just finally have time to do it all. So we're just 
going all in. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Well, I agree 100% with everything that y'all have said. And I think it's such a really important thing for us to consider because part of what I kind of see on the horizon for us is we've had this opportunity to reflect on what new tools do we need to add to our prevention toolbox? Uh, and it's adapting to move more things online, to connect with more people online and con connect with each other. Um, and also, uh, Nora, to your point, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about how it's forced us to have these really critical conversations on health inequity and social inequities. And so how are we viewing our work through this lens now of health equity? Um, so I almost see it as twofold. Like, we look at what youth are doing online and we lift up and amplify those efforts because youth are amazing and do innovative stuff to stay connected to each other. So provide them more opportunity and space for that and recognize in our work where we need to start working on these more structural issues um, to really address these social and health uh, inequalities that that we know already existed, but now we are actually having a moment where we have to begin thinking about them critically and how we apply that to our work. Um, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of really good opportunity for where the work takes us. Well, and I just wanna go back to where we started with Nicole's idea that we're all preventionists now, because yeah. I do think that um, in moving forward, there is a role that everybody not only in advocacy programs, but in a community can play in preventing domestic and sexual violence. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I always like ending on a really positive note with kind of a like random question. Um, and so really quickly, just wanted to go around and ask, what are you all doing for self-care? How are you taking care of yourself right now? Because we know that that's an important part of our job, but especially right now, making sure that we take time to care for ourselves is important. Um, so I'm curious from you all, what are y'all doing to, to take care of yourself in this time? Yeah, um, I'll start. Um, so I just got a new dog a few weeks Aww. ago. Um, hey. Her name is Millie and she's a two-year-old basset hound and she's an angel, I'm so in love with her. Um, so she has definitely been a huge part of my self care, um, cause she's hilarious and wonderful. And then she forces me to get up in the morning, get outside. Um, so she's been such a, um, big part of my self care. I'm so thankful, um, for that. Um, and trying to stay connected with people, um, has been, been really helpful for me. So having Zoom calls with family and friends has just been, um, amazing and, like we've kind of talked about with our work, um, you know, this this time is really forcing us to uh, make connections and think about our connections in a different way. And like, I wouldn't have had Zoom calls with my family otherwise because we're, you know, busy in our day-to-day -day lives. So I'm so thankful to be able to connect in those ways. And that's really done a lot for my self-care for sure. Um, and then I'm not gonna lie to y'all, I have been eating a lot of junk food and I am not <laughs> sad about it. Um, <laughs> Cheez-Its. Pop-Tarts, mm -hmm. cereal, I've been there for all that. And you know what? Life's all about balance. And so right. <laughs> um, that's definitely been a big part of my comfort and self-care <laughs> recently. So yeah. I bought Pop-Tarts for the first time in probably 20 years. <laughs> Same. They taste so and, good right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's amazing. Amazing. I've just allowed myself that space that maybe I wouldn't have ordinarily allowed myself yeah. Um, before and yeah it's been fantastic <laughs> mm -hmm. nice um I am lucky enough to live in a house with two porches and a fence in the backyard nice um, the back porch is set up as a writing and reading retreat with a oh. couple of chairs so I've been spending a lot of time on the porches and yeah that sounds lovely planting stuff um I also taught my cousins and nieces the joy of Marco Polo 
Yes, I love Marco Polo. <laughs> yes, it is so cool to be able to get video messages from my nieces and nephew. Um, I don't know if they're as excited about it as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so that has kind of kept me happy and comfortable and smiling. Love that. Yeah, I really like that. That sounds lovely. Well, I can relate to a lot of the things you all brought up. I've eaten so many Cheez-Its during this <laughs> pandemic. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. They're delicious. Yes. Um, but I have been getting through just by, I think, really um, getting excited about small things and celebrating the little things, like listening to a thunderstorm last night was gorgeous and beautiful. And like every little flower I see come up, I get very excited about. And I planted some herbs and their little like green faces are starting to show and I'm very excited about that. So just like the little things, I think. Um, mm -hmm. And cheese it. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can second that. The food is going great. I've been <laughs> um, supporting local businesses a lot. <laughs> Because I love that, Nicole, good to spend. <laughs> <laughs> we need to support people and I don't need to cook every day. Um, so, so yeah, I've been eating just delicious local food. Highly recommend. Um, tip your delivery driver. They're doing real good work. Um, and then the other thing, like Nora was saying, you know, taking advantage of nature and being happy about it. Every time I have a challenge for myself. So every time that the sun comes out, um, or I like notice the weather, like if I'm like, Ooh, it's hot or it's cold or it started raining or lightning, whatever. I have to go outside. Like that's my challenge. So there have been sunny days. Um, you know, it's Missouri. It was, it was real cold for a minute. Um, <laughs> I did some rain dancing, you know, just like any time <laughs> the weather changes and I notice I'm walking out the door, I'll drop whatever I'm doing and have a little nature break. And it has been very helpful. <laughs> Mm -hmm. love I love that. What a good mindfulness practice, like even beyond this, you know? Mm -hmm. What have you been doing, Matthew? Uh, so mine are very similar to Rachel's. Um, I got a puppy right before all of this happened, and so he takes up a lot of time forcing me to get up in the morning, forcing me to get up out of my chair and away from my desk and my office and go outside more often. Um, and uh, so that's been really nice. And because he's a puppy, there's also plenty of comic relief just because <laughs> he's goofy and lanky and uh, just a spaz at times as well. Um, so that's been really nice. Uh, and then also a lot of baking. Um, I think every weekend my partner and I have been making another batch of cookies to get us through the week. <laughs> yeah. So it's just been a lot of like baking and bed time. Mm -hmm. I, love I really love it that both of your puppies have people names, Ben and Millie. Excellent puppies. <laughs> I'm a big fan of giving pets people names because I think it really helps to like bring out their personality. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Rachel, but anytime that he's in trouble, uh, it goes from Ben to Benjamin. <laughs> a serious tone to my voice. Oh, yeah, she goes from Millie to Mildred pretty quickly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I love that. Well, again, I just want to close out by saying thank you all for taking time to be on the webcast and for really contributing to this conversation and us being able to dig deeper into it. Uh, so, Nicole, thanks for writing that article last month and then yeah, we got to really continue it. And I think it's a really good thing for us to share out. So thank you all. Stay safe, healthy, take good care. And I'll talk to you all soon. All right. Thanks, Matthew. Bye, everyone. Bye. Great to see you all. Most definitely.